And in the lesson plan, that is one of the explicit tasks that students have, yes. where they look at longer portions of the speech because yep. it's actually a fairly long speech, but it talks about all of the issues mm -hmm. that are going on in the Black community in 1883, like political equality, social equality, civil rights, education. And we ask students to look at those segments of the text and say, how does this connect to today? How might we still need or be facing these issues today? Yep. So right. why teach the color conventions? Because all those issues are still relevant today, right? Black civil rights organizing was established before the 1950s. Political organizing uh, consistently uh, interrogated the notions, consistently questioned, constantly questioning um, the, uh, the power structure, how it's developed, how it's being laid out, and how to push back against it and infiltrate it, right? Um, cultural literacy and responsiveness. Um, we want to be able to show students how to learn about history, uh, apply it to today, but that's not good enough because unless you're taking some form of action um, and pairing it with what you're learning, then what is the actual purpose, right? So we want our students to be able to take action and put things into practice. And obviously uh, the first convention and, and the first several conventions uh, all have Philadelphia roots. So this is the birthplace of what will become very large and, and possibly uh, large enough to, to span uh, the diaspora, or at least the Atlantic one. And I am gonna actually pass it off to uh, Ms. Kaziah Ridgeway. And we're going to get y'all started with our interactive activity. So, hi, everybody. I am going to use my teacher voice. Um, I have to. I teach 12th graders right now and 10th graders. So this is the me they get every day. Uh, so hopefully y'all can hear me. Uh, <laughs> all right. So this is actually a picture from Chalkbeat, which is a, a national news organization. But we have one here. And they actually came to my school and got to and, and were able to witness this um, little lesson that we're about to do in person. Um, so in thinking about being a part of creating curriculum for the color Commission, I thought of another activity to do because I wanted my students to be fully immersed in what they were doing, doing in this time period. This is really important. Um, this was for my African American history class. And uh, oftentimes when you learn about history, students are very much like, that was a long time ago. What is the relevance to today? And so I figured that recreating a color convention from that time period with my students would be A, the best way to bring this historical convention to them, but also B, get them to start thinking about what is happening today that might be worthy of a color convention, right? And so as you can see, I do teach at Northeast. Um, I am in the magnet program and our numbers look a lot different in the magnet program. Uh, so our school is about, I wanna say 70 to 80% African-American or black. Uh, however, our magnet program looks very differently. And so we, in, in me teaching and understanding that the audience is different, I also have to be very conscious about bringing in other history into the course and into the curriculum so that there's a buy-in with my students for this information because they are not African American. All right, so we've all went over this before. We know what the color dimensions were. Denise did an amazing job. I'm sorry, Miss Denise. It's the Southerner in me. But I'm not from the South. My dad and my grandma was. Okay. Uh, Alabama, North Carolina. All right, so from 1830 until what? Well, after the Civil War, African Americans gathered across the United States and Canada, and as Ms. Denise said, other places to create color conventions. And I think this is really important because when I think about Black Lives Matter today, uh, oftentimes they try to separate that from the movement of civil rights, right? And we know that it is a very long tradition. Our, our advocate, advocating our intellectualism didn't just start with the civil rights movement. Right. It goes back further than that. We can take it all the way back to the continent of Africa when you had Africans coming over being fully literate. They don't want you to know that. Speaking multiple languages, including, including Arabic, right? 
So it's important that we talk about those things. I wanted my students to understand that this was a movement that was started because of a 16 year old, right? Because they are 15 and 16 and 17 in my classroom. And oftentimes if someone mentioned, we don't listen to young people and they don't realize the power that they have. And I oftentimes, right before the pandemic, which is so funny, I remember two of my kids came to me with a petition. They were like, it's rich, like, sign this petition. I said, what's the petition? They're like, we don't want to wear uniforms anymore. <laughs> All right, first of all, is my name anywhere on the petition? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we, we don't have anyone. Okay, so it's a sense of the bag. Okay, <laughs> but that's because of lessons like this, right? Yeah. Because they heard about this 16 year old boy saying, we need to do something about what is happening to our people. And an adult, Richard Allen saying, you are absolutely right. We're gonna do this at Mother Bethel, Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, right? Um, and so when they, when, I, when they hear that, I ask them, what are you doing? Right, and then some of the kids are like, play your video games. Um, but I had, I had one of my new students, literally she was new to class, like her second day. And she was like, well, first of all, Ms. Ridgeway, I'm on the Student Council for Advocacy Against Gun Violence. And I all, I was like, oh, right now. <laughs> I like to hear that. That's what I like to hear. Come on with it, right? Um, and so that's the introduction to um, this next lesson. So we wanted, um, or I should say, I wanted my students to really get into a mind, the mind of an abolitionist, really understand what was going on at that time. But the color conventions were for black people, right? And so I you have to take on that, that mindset of what would it have been like to be black during that time period and advocating for the things that we're advocating for, right? Um, and so I tell them, I want you to create an autobiography right? You can be from anywhere. You can have, you know, there were Native American and Black people during this time period, right? I want you to really think about what you want to do. And then I introduced them to the Color Conventions website. And we look at Black women and what they did for the Color Conventions. Some of them owned boarding houses. Some of them were seamstresses. Some of them were I had like no 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 really shots. <laughs> and I'm wrong with that word always like gets me. Um, but they were active and they were doing things. We look at that, we go through that, we go throughout the website, we look at some of the other profiles that are there. And I'm like, use that to help you create your autobiography. And you have to come up with a name, which is the fun part for them, right? Um, and so they come up with names that were they're, they're awesome names actually. They use like basketball players. Um, some of them use my name, uh, but then we, I give them a card. So we're going to present, right? All of you would be getting a card right now. You would be writing your abolitionist name. I let them, you're an abolitionist, okay? So you have to get in the mindset of one. So they put their names in their card, and then we hand out the papers. And I tell them from this, from today, till the end of us closing out our convention, these are the names you have to use. What I would like all of you to do right now, I believe you have two sheets on your table. The first one is just so you can see um, directions for creating their autobiography, but you don't really have to pay much attention to that. The important one right now is the sheets where students are, or I'm sorry, delegates are in their committee for the color convention. And that is what the issue they might have discussed in their committee, okay? And so I am gonna give you all about 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, if you finish early, that's fine. Um, but I'm gonna give you all about 10 minutes, seven to seven minutes, it should be. And I just want you all to read the situation that you have. So, um, I think each table all has one, has the same one, right? Um, so they, the issues run the gamut of 
whether black people should integrate schools or whether they like, this is the 1800s and they're having this conversation, right? Whether black people should integrate schools or whether they should create their own. Um, some of the other ones are relating to um, should uh, or how should businesses support um, those who are newly arrived to the city um, and escaped from, from being enslaved. Um, some of them ask about whether Black people should purchase guns and arm themselves with guns to be able to protect themselves, especially those who are participating in the Underground Railroad. So there's a whole host of topics. And so we're just going to have you all read them. Um, and then you are going to be a part of our convention. Hear ye, hear ye. Welcome one and all to the first colored convention held right here in the city of Philadelphia at the Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Then they start to get when we talk about black churches and how long their names are. And I love it. Um, love it. All right, so impressed with a firm and settled conviction and more especially being taught by that inestimable and invaluable instrument, namely the Declaration of Independence, that all men and women, I add that on so the girls in the class know what's up, are born free and equal and consequently are endowed with unalienable rights, among which are the enjoyments of life liberty, and the pursuits of happiness. Viewing these as incontrovertible facts, we have been led to the following conclusions. That our forlorn and deplorable situation earnestly allowed me, the man of us, to devise and pursue all legal means for the speedy elevation of ourselves and brethren to the scale and standing of men. Okay, Martin Luther King taught me. All right, to effect these great objects, we would earnestly request our brethren throughout the United States to cooperate with us by forming societies auxiliary to the parent institution about being established in the city of Philadelphia under the patronage of the General Convention. Welcome! My esteemable colleagues, you all were placed into committees and have been having these important conversations that re relate to our community and our people. And now you are going to share your decision. We are going to go around and you are going to tell me what it is you have decided in relation to the question at hand. Are we ready, colleagues? Yes. yes. Are we ready, delegates? Yes. yes. All right. Should the color conventions allow, ooh, this was the fun one in my class. Should the color conventions allow women to participate in the color convention proceedings and give speeches? Wow. We came from the vantage of a well, play on words. So it says, should women be allowed to participate? in the color conventions. And as history has taught us, you know, Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt was the voice, but Franklin, her husband, was the, was the face. So she was able to get a lot of things done vicariously by utilizing him. So if we're not, if we're not hell bent on having a woman as the face of it, but we want to get our point stressed, we want, it, we want there to be change. We want it to be um, immediate. We would say, find someone inside one of the males, preferably your husband, someone who you could trust to communicate the message of what it is that you have for women's liberation, for women's freedom, for uh, equality, for equity, however that may look. We felt, let's find a face to do that. And, and then, so there's a bottom part that you guys didn't, I just didn't see. It said there was a businesswoman who was invited in 1849, blah, blah, blah. So they were invited, but they weren't allowed to speak. 
They said, we're invited, but we are at the pride of voice. Um, they said it was wrong for a change. She said, you know what? We're not coming back until we are granted the ability to speak. And we're thinking to ourselves, you know, you've really disenfranchised yourself because anyone with wisdom knows that you can sit somewhere and you can learn, you can glean from where you are just by being silent. There's many things to learn. So if you were able to sit and participate by being an active listener, an observer to what's going on, and you have a male as the voice, you've written a speech. He's the voice. You're still getting your point of voice. Are you that worried about who it's coming from? Or are you trying to have a level uh, of efficacy as far as what's being commuted out? So in that same thing, we were saying that giving speeches, it's 1849. Women were still considered black. Your husband could beat you. Just to keep, if you were a nagging wife, New York said, we can give you her speech, just to keep her alive. Uh, you were, you were trapped. Um, even up until 1970, you had to get permission to get your tube signed, your birth control, to get an account. Um, you know, your husband had to give you that express permission. So if in 1970, we still didn't have the wherewithal to give women the very rudimentary rights, how then much harder would it have been for a woman to get that communicated by her own voice. And what are you batting up against? So yeah, I can say it, I can write a speech, but it's to be received. But if it's coming from a penis body person, I'm a sex educator, if it's coming from a penis, a penis body person, and that message is well received, so let it be. So you have to act in wisdom and still so that your message can be communicated, it can be effective, and it can be, um, it can be dispersed and disseminated to the people who can actually affect the change. In the long run. So we're forerunners. We are those people who go ahead. Mm. And we are the uh, predecessors. We are the soon to be ancestors of those coming up. So we have to be some forerunners. And when you're a forerunner, you're the, like there's a formation of birds, right? And you see them. The ones in the front, they're taking the hit. Mm -hmm. And the other ones, you're back up against that for them. Mm -hmm. So I see these women as forerunners. You're going to take the hit for the others so that we can sit here, multicultural and have our intellects mesh and meld and learn of each other in a safe environment where it's heard, it's understood, it's mm. celebrated, and we can communicate what we need in a way that we can disseminate to others and be the voice. So mm. I know that was more than what you guys wanted. No, but. <laughs> All right, that concludes our convention. Thank you. But I did want to go through and just give y'all a little bit of insight about these uh, scenarios and how like the younger folks uh, would have answered the question. So here's the thing, the same way there was like mixed responses is the same way it was mixed responses in the classroom, right? Which gave the opportunity to have very rich historical conversations around a host of things, right? So if we're starting off with number one, about uh, should Black people move to different places, Haiti, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Uh, some of my, or Canada, some of my students say, yes, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> we, we should go, right? Which was, yes, that was a sentiment for the time period. And the color conventions in the beginning actually supported resettlement in Canada. And then later on, they were like, you know what, we from here, we're going to stay, right? Um, and so that also was perfectly acceptable. We also, in my classroom, spent some time, about a few minutes, just talking about what happened with Liberia, with African-Americans going back to Liberia. And unfortunately, some of them came with a, the, a colonizer mindset, um, which caused conflict, but also Liberians still participating in the slave trade. And African-Americans are like, how are you still doing this, right? So that created conflict. Uh, now, m many of them are living in harmony. The families are uh, intertwined. I have some Liberian students in my class that have American names, so they know that their ancestry is from the African-American, but they have Africans in their family. So we have, you know, those conversations. Number two, again, um, this was mixed, and I purposely wanted it to be. I told each class, somebody has to play devil's advocate, Okay. Do your thing, okay? <laughs> Do your big one. Like, go in, right? And so they did. Um, I had some of them that were like, women, no, we don't want you to speak. Your, your job is to be in the kitchen barefoot and making my dinner, right? 
Um, and the girls got in on it too. It was hilarious. Um, so we know in some abolitionist organizations, uh, women were not, want, they did not want to add women in. Um, in the color conventions, women were allowed um, to participate after Mary Jane Pointer um, said, I'm going to go. And they were like, no. In organizations like the AASS, which is the American Anti-Slavery Society, the fact that Greenwood Garrison, uh, that was founded in James Fortin's home, by the way. But the, the AASS actually, that was one of the main reasons that it split. In addition to William Lloyd Garrison just being down for the cause and they're like, okay, you're too much. So it's split, right? Um, with some people like, we don't want women to participate. But the color conventions um, acquiesced and did allow women to participate. Should black people have schools, right? Or should they have their own schools or integrate? Again, it was mixed. Some of my students were very astute in thinking about where are we today in education? I know that we told them not to, but they're like, no, like we should make our own schools and teach our own children because we don't have to integrate. If we integrate, the things are going to be watered down. I'm like, okay, do that. Jerome, that's not his name, but I'm just going to give him a name. Um, and then the, you had other students that were like, mm, you know, let's, let's, let's do both. We didn't have any students that were like, yeah, let's just integrate. So it was either no, like no integration or let's do both, right? Um, which again is perfectly acceptable and normal for that time period. People were the same way, like let's integrate or let's do both. And they did actually, that was a decision for the, the color commission. Um, number four, with anti-black anti violence and guns. Um, what I tell them, um, and I introduced this to them before, like a lot of abolitionists were Quaker and or Christian, so they believed in nonviolence. So many of them would have said no to guns because they didn't want to escalate the situation. But I mean, you are a conductor on the Underground Railroad. You might have done it. You have done it. Do you? And we got your back. I did have a really funny uh, one group of kids said, um, no, we're not going to buy the guns. We'll have our white allies buy the guns and that will be our bodyguards. And I was like, you know what? So y'all was over here thinking, right? Um, yes. And then the final one um, is about local businesses. So this was an opportunity to showcase the Color Convention website and look through their Black Women in Business um, exhibit, which is on there. Um, and for the students, they were able to connect it back to oh, uh, we'll go to the bakery to provide food um, and we'll go to the seamstress to, to provide clothes. We also talk about William Still during this time period because one of the questions that came up was, which was, how do we know all these things that we know about the Underground Railroad and abolitionism and et cetera? And I'm like, well, you know, shout out to Philly. We're always, <laughs> you know, we're always right there. He collected all these stories and that could have, not only had him killed, but it could have destroyed the whole thing. But I'm thankful that he had the wherewithal to do that because we now have so much information about how people journey from the South to the North, okay? So um, thank you all for participating. Um, hopefully you can see the value of maybe doing something like this within your class. It elicited a lot of conversation, half of the conversation I do not have time to even bring up here, but the kids get really, really into it. So just as an overview, um, one of the things Nick told us earlier was if you scan this QR code, you will have access to the curriculum. This is what you're gonna have access to. So there are two units that were developed in, I wanna say 29, in the before time. Um, and we worked on the together. So Nick and I actually worked on unit one, because I and Adam Sanchez, who's not with us today, worked on unit two. But as a teacher, one of the things I want to say about these units and that process was I teach social studies. And I rarely have the chance to have an experience with a historian. And the process, even though, again, it took a lot of work and a lot of time, um, the process of having a historian um, talk about practice and also content at the same time made all of these units so much richer than they would have been had just a historian done them or just a teacher done them. So I want you to know that when you're using these, you are using um, the work of 
the historian and the teacher together in tandem. So unit one is basically an overview of that first convention in Philadelphia. So that first lesson, why to hold a color convention? Why are we holding it? We go back to that speech that we saw early on. And we look at a longer excerpt of the speech and we start to make connections. What was going on then that's still going on now? What are these issues that are affecting the black community? And why are they still persisting? Then we asked students to look at the first convention in context and the idea that black people are not a monolith. Just like we all didn't agree in here about which way forward, a lot of times when we think about history, black people did this, right? They didn't talk about the difference in gender roles. They didn't talk about class. They didn't talk about the experiences of people who were born free versus people who were born into slavery. If you read some of the history textbooks that many of us still have in our classroom, you would think that there weren't any free black people anywhere before 1866. So when you are studying this also, and I, we're gonna keep coming back to the fact that we had a thriving population of free African-Americans that were the vanguard a lot of the civil rights organizing that was gonna happen in the rest of the country. So we have to talk about that as well. Now those differences come out in our third lesson, which is an immigration tea party. So just like that um, experience that you had, you had a role in that um, activity, you are put into an African-American family and you have to decide whether or not your family should stay or go. And when we think about immigration, we also have to consider that all the forces that wanted us to immigrate were not our friends, okay? There were a lot of organizations like the American Colonization Society that even though they were interracial, their goal was to get African-Americans out of the country. They did not want free African-Americans here. So keeping all of those different identities um, on the table as a family, you have to make a decision or the kids have to make a decision. Should we stay or should we leave? Now, lesson four, um, is about the difference between leadership and activism. And I thought about that lesson in the conversation about should women be allowed to participate in the convention? Because for the students, we want them to tease out, what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to be an activist? And in my classroom, a lot of students know that leaders are often men, but activists could be anybody. And those two things are not the same thing. So what does it take not only to be a leader or an activist, but we also ask students, what does that mean for you? What's your role in this? Okay, and then lesson five, we actually do include the instructions for a simulated convention in your own classroom. So that's that first unit. The second unit looked at black women and their role. So black women in economic empowerment in the color conventions. And this unit was actually fascinating to me. I like a lot of the things as I learned as I was writing this curriculum, did not know about the Black boarding house movement and the fact that women were the ones that were hosting and providing the economic drive for conventions like this to happen. So when we think about these ideas of gender, one of the things that I do love about the Color Conventions organization is that they are transparent about the contribution of Black women. Even if they are not named, and many of them are. They actually do some really good history about um, women in this time. Their impact is important. Lesson one and two is explicitly about, again, uncovering that hidden labor. So in the instances where women are named, let's, let's dig into that. Students are asked and tasked in all of these lessons to be historians. Um, they look at the boarding houses. They look at the different jobs that women had um, at that time. Same thing in Black women intellectuals and business owners. Um, the spirit of entrepreneurship that was clear throughout Philadelphia, particularly among women. Um, these are things and stories that our students often never get. So again, each lesson contains a teaching guide and student materials. Like you could literally teach this tomorrow if you felt like it. Um, but it's here for you. So if you haven't scanned that QR code, I encourage you to do it. You know, if you don't know how, take it and then give it to your, your little baby that knows how to work that stuff. <laughs> take a sheet, we got extra, but it is here for you. Um, and again, personally, it was a labor of love 
Um, we are proud of the work we did and all we want to do is share it for free. That's all we want to do. The thing that came up in the three weeks that I did this unit with my um, US history class over and over and over again is this question. Why haven't we learned this before? I've never heard this before. I've lived in Philadelphia my whole life. Why haven't we learned this before? And what it boils down to is they have taken so much from Black people in this country. And they continue to take from us when we don't even have the right to teach our students their own history. You know what's going on in Florida. In the classes that I'm taking right now, I have colleagues from all over the country and the stories they tell me about what they cannot do in places like Texas, in places like Florida, in places like Missouri, this is so much deeper than the AP. That we have a call. It is our responsibility to not only correct the record, but to extend it. Because we are in one of the few places that are left where we can do this kind of work. And this is not a risk because it's been vetted by teachers and historians. Remember where I started? Like that, right? That this is not somebody's opinion. This is not an internet conspiracy theory, okay? This is good history. This is solid history. And your students will be better for it. So let's talk about my students. Um, again, I work at Carver. Um, our student demographic is predominantly student of color, but we, we have a lot of diversity. We have students from like, over 50 countries um, in our building. So in my classroom, this is my second period class that um, did this project this year. There's a wealth of experience. So, you know, American born, immigrant, black, white, Asian, Latinx, all kinds of students in the room. Um, all of them were able to engage with this project. There are some activities where they have to sit and write by themselves, but also I feel like this helps them develop better answers of more depth because they're allowed to work together and talk to each other. Um, it's also accessible and you can differentiate. So just like we changed our convention topic because that's what my kids wanted and needed, feel free to make this your own. The history is there. You know what's best for your classroom. You know what works in your classroom. If it means that you have to, everything is in included as a Google Doc. If you have to change the language to make it more accessible for your students, do that. Um, in many of the activities, some of the words that were pretty common in the 19th century, like, hey, this is what this means. This is vocabulary. Feel free to make the charts and the columns, make them annotate, do the things you need to do. It's flexible and that's on purpose. We didn't give you a PDF. Make it your own. Um, the other thing is that it allows for student choice of voice. So there are so many ways for students to engage where they are interested. You've seen the student voice, but in almost every activity, students get to choose where they want to focus. And again, isn't that what we want for our students' education? And the last piece, which I think is probably the most important, is the rigor. We have not dumbed this down. These are important ideas and our students are capable. They can do it. A lot of people are afraid sometimes, particularly with dense historical text. Well, that's too hard. They're not gonna do, they're not gonna do. Once they figure out that Douglas is talking about the same stuff, police brutality, lynching, they wanna do it, but also they can. And because again, there's so much collaboration, Nobody is asked, none of the students are asked to do it alone. So 
they can access, again, all of those historical thinking skills that we talked about earlier. And thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dina Porter. She's going to be our closing for today. Thank you. And um, I've been out of the classroom for a few years. I'm 75 years old. But when I hear this, I want to go back in. <laughs> Maybe just one period. <laughs> <laughs>